question, um, primarily for Alex. How can housing be set up for urban indigenous people in the same way as you were doing up north? Um, a couple questions about how uh, settlers can learn from indigenous ways of knowing um, to address climate change, um, incorporating those sort of practices, both for adaptation and for um, mitigating climate change. I'll leave it at that. Um, to the questions, what challenges in, in, is Indigenous climate action finding when consulting with communities? And do you see the truth and reconciliation recommendations as important in moving from an, a colonial economics to redefining relationships to law? Well, thank you. Land, community, and new economic paradigms. What are key messages? Can you distribute that last yes. question? Um, do you see the truth and reconciliation recommendations as important in moving from a colonial economics to redefining relationship to land, community, and a new economic paradigm? And what are key messages? So do you want to start with Alex with the um, question? Okay. I'll plug Alex as the speaker's Okay. Okay, well, as that's happening, you, you can. Yeah. as that's happening, I'll just uh, answer the how settlers can learn from, from us. And um, basically, is start by creating these relationships. Awesome, thank you. Uh, start by creating the relationships. So, um, you saw that Indigenous Climate Action website. Go there, start to read up on that, look at some of the different organizations. Um, as we organize, come to our events. And come to our events and just sit and listen and allow us to lead and learn from us. One of the things that when we talk about white privilege, which some makes people upset to hear about, uh, people aren't always aware of that privilege. It can be, um, it's very invisible, and you don't notice it until it's not present, and it might feel like oppression. But come to our organizations, and come to our events, and sit and listen from us. And um, as far as the deeper stuff that, that Philip and I were talking about too, I mean, we do open up some of our, our ways to people, but it, it's, it takes a long time. It, it takes relationship building, so you're not gonna come in just like that. Um, but just come and talk to us. If you're interested in that, come and talk to us today. We're gonna be here all day, and it's just start starting those relationships. Uh, the challenges that ICA uh, is having in consulting its communities is basically uh, right now a capacity issue. The biggest thing is capacity, um, and um, and I mentioned this yesterday, a lot of our communities uh, be, are so susceptible because of the extreme poverty that our leaders are being enticed to um, go into oil and gas industries for economic development, and so there's a lot of division in our own communities that we're sorting through just as in the greater society. And as far as the TRC, you know, I'm actually not as deeply familiar with the TRC recommendations as I am with um, the United Nations Rights on the Declarations of Indigenous Peoples as something that I really lift up and look at. I think there's some good recommendations, but I'm going to be honest with all of you, reconciliation is something I've stopped talking about until I see you guys stepping up and taking it very, very seriously about changing your mindset and changing your structures, your colonial laws. I am not talking about reconciliation. That is on you guys to figure it out. And then come talk to us. very carefully to what you were saying. <clears throat> Both uh, very important messages. Um, there's a couple, I've got text to the couple of questions and then um, the question from the audience and I think they the, they all relate and um, one was how can we bring, um, how can housing be done in an urban <clears throat> kind of setting and I think um, the key is there how and I think that's that's one of the things that um, that the other presentations kind of reinforced as well is that um, that it has to come from the indigenous community. So uh, we are working with um, urban indigenous people in Minneapolis, and they're they're trying to set up another one house many nations project, but it's going to be responsive to what their needs are in that in that community. So in the in the design of it, um, it necessarily has to come from community members and then it has to be responsive to their needs. <clears throat> and then linking that to the question that I was texted um, uh, around, um, you know, people 
people were semi-nomadic. We moved around. We lived in um, founding clusters, and we hunted and fished, you know, in different places, places throughout the year. So how can we return to that kind of model? Well, I'm not sure if that's possible, but we can um, think about what that means in a contemporary context. So how can we make housing responsive to the land, for example? And that, again, um, has to come from practitioners who are using the land and who rely on the land for sustenance or <clears throat> even just for, um, you know, for um, sustaining sustaining the lifestyles that they're living. Um, so again, it returns to the question of principles. So the, uh, what are the underlying principles that we can return to? And I think that's part of the design process. So not necessarily saying, well, you know, let's re rebuild teepees in the bush because that doesn't really work. But let's see what the context of the land is in the region where we're um, trying to build homes and make it responsive to the land there. So one of the ways that we've done that is by trying to use local um, local products such as spruce for the houses, um, you know, rather than shipping in from other regions. So that I think it would be very um, locally um, contextual. So we're um, looking, we're talking with other communities as well that are starting the design process. And they're saying, well, could you come and do what you did in OCN in our community? And we can't come and rebuild a house like it's not going to look the same. So it's got to be responsive to the needs of the community where, um, you know, where and how the land is in that region. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I just. And I just wanted to wrap up too by just saying um, that I'm not normally so harsh, but we're getting pretty weary, and um, and I'm usually much more of the uh, kind. No, I'm not apologizing, but I'm also just saying like we, we're getting quite weary, and I really believe in what you guys can do, and so I really am starting to like set the bar much higher that it's not enough just to do like the land recognition when you start an event. <laughs> we're really expecting laws need to be changed, decolonization. And, and really you guys hold the power in this society. So when we talk about a just transition, thinking about transitioning the power structures as well, and, and that's on you. So I'm really just I'm calling on everybody. And I say this with a fierce, deep love for my people in the land. And that's why I'm, I'm kind of harsh, because I believe that we can do it. And this just transition is going to require that we all rise and step up into this challenge. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for this panel, and thanks to Alex who joined us um, on the phone. We're going to move right into our next workshops. We're going to eat 15 minutes into lunch. That should work well in case lunch is late again today. <laughs> um, so we're, we'll be roughly back on time. The coal phase-out workshop with Climate Justice Saskatoon is going to be in this room. And Jared Clark is setting up in the furthest room right now. Um, and that workshop is about climate change education. So if you can quickly, uh, you might need to take your chair with you if you're going to Jared Clark's workshop in the furthest room.